world needed it most. So congratulations to her. You can see the great article that they did on her on our Facebook page at VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Britain has approved Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for emergency use. Developed by the American drug maker Pfizer and Germany's BioNTech, it is the world's first COVID-19 vaccine to complete a rigorous and scientific vaccine development process. China and Russia approved COVID-19 vaccines without waiting for results from large trials known as Phase 3 trials. Britain's Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency said it used a rolling review to study as information became available from Pfizer during the trials. The process permitted the agency to approve the vaccine in a short amount of time. The approval came just 12 days after Pfizer and BioNTech said they were requesting emergency use approval from regulatory agencies around the world. Final results from the large Phase 3 study found the vaccine to be 95% effective against COVID-19. Dr. June Rain, the chief executive of MHRA, said the safety of the public will always come first. She added, and I emphasize again that this recommendation has only been given by the MHRA following the most rigorous scientific assessment of every piece of data. British Health Secretary Matt Hancock told the British Broadcasting Corporation that help is on its way. He added, When this vaccine is rolled out, things will get better. We will start that process next week. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration will meet on December 10th to consider Pfizer's emergency use request. The agency will meet again on December 17th to look at American drug maker Moderna's emergency use request for its vaccine. Speaking on the U.S. television news program Good Morning America Wednesday, Dr. Monsef Slawi said he would expect the FDA to reach a similar conclusion that British officials had reached. In other words, he expects the FDA to approve Pfizer's request. Slowey is head of the U.S. Operation Warp Speed program. The European Medicines Agency said it has received emergency use requests from both Pfizer and Moderna. The agency added its decision could be issued within weeks. British regulators are also considering another vaccine developed by AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford. Britain said it would start vaccinating high-risk groups using 800,000 shots from Pfizer's manufacturing centre in Belgium early next week. The treatment requires two shots which means about 400,000 Britons will receive the treatment this year. Pfizer has agreed to supply Britain with 40 million shots of vaccine through 2021. Age is by far the single most important factor in terms of risk from COVID-19, said Wei Shen Lim, 
head of Britain's COVID-19 vaccine committee. In the United States, a government advisory group said Tuesday that healthcare workers and older people in nursing homes should be the first to receive the vaccine treatments. The U.S. is expected to receive 40 million shots of vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna by the end of this year, enough to vaccinate 20 million people. The speed of the rollout will depend on how quickly Pfizer and BioNTech can manufacture the vaccine. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine must be stored and shipped at extremely cold temperatures of around minus 70 degrees Celsius. Pfizer said it has developed shipping containers that use dry ice to keep the vaccines cold. The containers are also equipped with GPS sensors to follow their movements. There is little to do in Norcater, Kansas. It has a service station, a building for storing grain, and a weekend place where the locals play pool, eat pizza, and drink beer. Yet COVID-19 still found this small rural town, which is home to about 150 people. In an old tradition, the town gathers for a potluck dinner at Christmas time. The event is known as the Norcater Christmas Drawing. People donate meats, crafts, and other treats. Usually, every family goes home with prizes. The 4-H Club, an agricultural organization for children, holds a sale of baked goods. Santa Claus comes to the event, too. But this year, the drawing has been cancelled due to the coronavirus health crisis. A recent statement in the town's newsletter and Facebook page announced the cancellation. It blamed lack of concern for others for the action. Decatur County has fewer than 3,000 people. Most people live on farms or in small towns like Norcater. As of last week, the county had reported 194 coronavirus cases and one death. Medical providers say there have been at least four more deaths that have not been added to the official count. Carolyn Plotz is a 73-year-old Norcater resident. She only found out she was positive for COVID-19 when tested for a medical procedure in October. She never had symptoms. Plotz said two of her former high school classmates who live in the county died because of the virus. Her husband also tested positive. It's been very real to me, she said. Plotz wondered whether the cancellation announcement was maybe talking about me. During her quarantine, she would only leave her house to care for a housebound friend who still believes the pandemic is not real. Plotz said she left her house with her doctor's permission and wore a mask. Carl Lyon is the Norcater mayor. He said that most residents are pretty good about social distancing and wearing a mask, but some have caught the virus. I know a couple of people had it, and they were still kind of running around, Lyon said. Didn't seem to bother them that they infected everybody else. 
Decatur County Sheriff Ken Badsky estimated that 5% of county residents who should quarantine violate the restrictions and go out. His office has called some and insisted they do what they are supposed to do, but has taken no legal action. I have so much other stuff to do. I don't have time to follow people around, Badsky said. We have 900 square miles. We have three full-time officers and a part-time to take care of that, and we are busy with everything else. Stan Miller was the announcer for the Christmas drawing for more than 25 years. He has mixed feelings about the decision to stop it this year. The 63-year-old Norcator resident said he understands there are elderly people who could get the virus. But it is also disappointing. I like to see all the joy, especially the little kids, Miller said. We have Santa Claus after the drawing is over, and to see them sit on Santa's lap and tell them what they want for Christmas, you know, always puts a smile on my face. I'm John Russell. U.S. government study has found that facial recognition technology is getting better at identifying people wearing masks. The study is part of ongoing research by the U.S. Commerce Department's National Institute of Standards and Technology. The agency has examined the effectiveness of more than 150 facial recognition systems on people wearing face coverings. The systems are powered by machine learning algorithms. The first results of the study were announced in July as health officials across the world urged people to wear masks to limit the spread of the coronavirus. New findings were released this week. Police agencies around the world have long used facial recognition technology to search for and help catch people accused of crimes. It can also be used to unlock phones or other electronic devices, and in some cases, even vehicles. Some robots use facial recognition technology to recognize the people they are communicating with. However, the wide use of masks in public has created major difficulties for such systems. The study looked at facial recognition systems already in use before the pandemic. It also looked at systems specially developed to work on masked faces. Developers of the technology voluntarily provide their algorithms for testing. The NIST said it processed a total of 6.2 million images for the experiment. These included pictures provided by individuals seeking U.S. immigration benefits as well as images from border crossings of travelers entering the United States. People in the images were not actually wearing masks, so the researchers digitally added different mask shapes to faces in the pictures for use in the study. In some cases, up to 70% of a person's face was covered in the images. Overall, the NIST said its research shows that the top performing facial recognition systems fail to correctly identify unmasked individuals about 0.3% of the time. The failure rate rose to about 5% with masked images tested with the most effective systems.
Many of the lower-performing algorithms, however, had much higher error rates with masked images, as high as 20 to 50 percent. In the latest findings, researchers included results from 65 new facial recognition systems that have been developed since the start of the pandemic. Some of these systems performed significantly better than the earlier ones, the NIST's Mei Ying said in a statement on Tuesday. She is a lead researcher on the project. In the best cases, software algorithms are making errors between 2.4 and 5 percent of the time on masked faces, Eng said. She added that this performance rate is comparable to where the technology was in 2017 on non-masked photos. The researchers reported that the systems were much more effective at identifying individuals when one image of the person was masked and the other was unmasked. When faces were covered in both photos, failure rates rose greatly. Not surprisingly, the study found that round-shaped masks, which cover only the mouth and nose, led to fewer errors than wider ones that stretch across the cheeks. Also, masks covering the nose led to higher failure rates than those that did not. The new study also ran tests to see whether different colored masks would affect error rates. The team used red, white, black, and light blue. The research findings suggested that generally the red and black masks led to higher failure rates than the other colors. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In March of 1868, Congress tried to remove President Andrew Johnson from office. But the Senate failed in the effort by one vote. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. Congress was controlled by radical members of the Republican Party. Most of the charges at Johnson's trial were based on his dismissal of the Secretary of War. A new law said the president could not remove a cabinet officer without Senate approval. Johnson said the law was unconstitutional. The trial was an important turning point in the making of the nation. Removal from office would have established the idea that the president could serve only with the approval of Congress. The president would have become, in effect, a prime minister, requiring the support of Congress to remain in office. Andrew Johnson's victory kept alive the idea of an independent presidency. Although Congress failed to remove him, the vote did not end a conflict with the White House over the future of the South. But it did have an effect on efforts to rebuild the South following the war. Radical Republicans wanted to punish the South for starting the war. They also wanted to be sure new governments in the southern states would support the Republican Party. Doug Johnson and Frank Oliver tell about the reconstruction of the South. One way radical Republicans gained support was by helping give blacks the right to vote. They knew former slaves would vote for the party which had freed them. Another way Republicans kept control in the South 
was by preventing whites from voting there. They passed a law saying no Southerner could vote if he had taken part in the rebellion against the Union. This prevented the majority of Southern whites from voting for Democrats and against Republicans. Congress also made strong rules about what Southern states had to do to re-enter the Union. It said each of the states needed a new constitution that protected the voting rights of all black men. And it said each Southern state must approve an amendment to the United States Constitution that gave citizenship to blacks. The radicals did not rest with changes in the law. They also sent their supporters south to organize blacks for the Republican Party. Many Southern whites hated these men from the North. They had a special name for them, carpetbaggers. The name arose because many of the Northerners who went south arrived with all their possessions in a carpet handbag. Southerners also had a name for their own people who cooperated with the carpetbaggers. They called them scalawags. Neither name was friendly. Southern whites had a reason to be bitter. They had lost the Civil War. Now much of their power was gone, and they were suffering. But there was another side to the story as well. Southern whites had held black people in slavery for many years. Now the former slaves were getting to enjoy a small taste of freedom. Also, the South had started the Civil War, which had caused so much death and destruction. It was not surprising that the North showed little sympathy when the fighting stopped and the South lay in ruins. Southern states organized conventions to form new governments. Soon, all but three Southern states had new legislatures. Not surprisingly, radical Republicans held firm control in every one of the new governments. Many of the new governors and state officials were carpetbaggers from outside the state. Others were southern scalawags. Many of these new state officials were dishonest. They began using their power to become rich. In South Carolina, for example, the new governor was a former army officer from the state of Ohio. He gave government jobs to many dishonest men, including some who were wanted for crimes in other states. The same situation existed in other state governments in the South. In Louisiana, for example, the governor was a carpetbagger from the state of Illinois. He left office after four years with one million dollars. His official pay during that time was only $32,000. The South was not the only place where public officials were dishonest. The period after the Civil War in the United States was marked by several famous incidents involving violations of the public trust. Some of these incidents took place in the North, even in the White House. They were among the worst examples of dishonesty and poor government ever to take place in American history. It also is important to note that not everyone in the South was dishonest. The new state governments did many good things. They built roads and bridges, schools and hospitals. They improved transportation and education. They loaned money to companies to build railroads. Most important, they helped give hope to former slaves. 
these people were struggling to create a new life in the land of their former owners. So the record of Reconstruction in the South was mixed. Many Southerners believe, even today, that Reconstruction was a bitter time of defeat. But others now say this period after the Civil War was a necessary step in creating a different kind of South from the one which had existed before. Historians do agree that Reconstruction changed the United States in several important ways. One of the most important changes was in the Constitution. Congress passed three historic amendments to the Constitution during this period. The first was the Thirteenth Amendment. It ended slavery in the United States. The next was the Fourteenth Amendment. It said, All persons born or naturalized in the United States were citizens of the United States and of the state in which they lived. It said no state could limit the rights of these citizens. Finally, there was the Fifteenth Amendment. It said a citizen of the United States could not be prevented from voting because of his color. The Thirteenth Amendment freed all Negro slaves. The Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments were supposed to protect their rights. These laws alone, however, did not succeed in doing this. It would take another century until Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders to make these rights a reality. Yet the passage of these three amendments to the Constitution was still a historic step in making blacks full and equal citizens. These same laws and other actions of the radical Republicans changed the South in other, less desirable ways. They helped cause angry whites to form the Ku Klux Klan and other groups that terrorized blacks for years to come. The laws also increased bitterness between the North and South that lasted many years. Reconstruction changed the economy of the South, too. White landowners broke up their big farms into smaller pieces of land. They rented these to black farmers. With the land came seed tools, and enough supplies for a year. In exchange for this, the owner would get a large share of the crop raised by the tenant farmer. This system, called sharecropping, spread through the South. It lasted for almost 100 years. Sharecropping made it possible for blacks to work the land for themselves for the first time in their lives but it also made it difficult for them to earn enough money to improve their condition. As a result, the majority of Southern blacks remained in poverty. The system helped cause the South to be the poorest part of the United States for many years. The Reconstruction period changed the face of the South and the United States. The events of Reconstruction also were central to one of the nation's most interesting presidential elections. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.